Greetings, colleagues, and, and welcome to the, to the panel on the, de the, the developing nation as a social entrepreneurial state. The, the, background, the, the background to this is we have massive challenges, particularly in the global south. And these challenges, while being met to varying degrees of success, haven't really had the sort of impact those of us in the social economy and social entrepreneurial space might have expected. So a few months ago, I thought the SOCAP would be the perfect space to posit the notion that we need to crank this up a little bit. We need to leverage and scale the, rate, the, rate, the way in which we so in the social economy and social enterprises play and take it to the level of the state in order to have the sorts of impact. And I've been very lucky because a couple of my big heroes have decided to join us this evening. Jed Emerson, whom you, you all will know, is a, it's a SOCAP veteran. Um, and, and, and Jed has kindly um, decided to, to lend his wisdom. Um, Doreen Shahaz, who I've met via, by, by um, Jed and I've become a big fan of her at IIX, has a very interesting and, and persuasive percep <laughs> percep uh, perspective on many of these things. And one of my, <clears throat> my long-term mentors, Luciano Balbo, out of, of Italy, um, uh, a former chairman of the, of, 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 of the Venture Capital Association there, and, and a prolific participant in many of these enterprises, is also joined us. And another colleague, Tuna Wilhelm from Namibia, is due to join us. So we're representing five, five continents. I, I'm actually from South America. And I'd like to, to invite, uh, to first to start the, the, the session by really just sharing a few thoughts on, 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 on this issue around how, well, firstly, should we and, uh, and why we should be scaling social enterprises and social entrepreneurship to the level of the state. So here goes. Colleagues, I've been in the social entrepreneurial space for perhaps uh, nearly two, thousand, two decades. And there have been fascinating, fascinating changes, not just in the world in which we operate, but also in the social entrepreneurship space. Entities like SOCAP um, have led the way in terms of tr normalizing social entrepreneurship, but it really has not shifted the needle in the way in which we expected. Social entrepreneurship became a, a thing, a word, a, a, a space, really from around the mid, the, the late 50s, early 60s. And it's been present and, and it's grown significantly. And that growth is taking place as the state itself, particularly in the global south, has shrunk. And it has shrunk partly because of various perspectives about the role of the state and it's been, and, and, and it's funding where, which has come under attack really because tax, the tax bases have been shriveled by various macroeconomic reforms. So a combination of structural and practical issues have limited the state's ability to get involved in creation of social capital. And this has meant that into that space has come amazing social entrepreneurs. Many of you in the audience are playing and doing great things to create social capital but yet we are not shifting the needle. And part of it is very simple and, and actually very clear because we operate very parochially in general. We don't have relationships across um, jurisdictions which allow us as any multinational would to scale the, the impact that we, that we have. And all the uh, people like Doreen are doing a, an amazing job at, at linking people and linking institutions the key institution across the globe to create change is the state. So why is it that the state which has the same mandate as we in the social entrepreneurial space have? And that mandate is pretty simple. The mandate is to create social capital in a sustainable way, be it a financially sustainable, environmentally sustainable, and in a way which respects the governance and the humanity of, of our peoples. So why is it that we continue to occupy a space of small individual efforts when we should be doing a couple of things I suggest to you. The first thing is, is that we should be advocating for our states, particularly developing nations, to behave like social enterprises, to aggregate resources and deploy the best brains that we can find to create massive social capital. Is it education, health, etc. 
The second thing we should be doing is creating a framework which allows social enterprises as is, exists for, for, for commercial businesses to grow aggressively, be it through fiscal reforms or simply um, in, encouraging, in, in encouraging them through other policy measures to grow and become larger so they have much greater impact. And the third issue I'd like to flag is the issue, and, 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 I, 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 and forgive me if I, if, if I offend some in, in, in the audience, but there's an obsession with innovation versus scaling. And I, don't, I know that the two concepts aren't necessarily in, in, in competition, but they're here in South Africa and indeed across the global south, we're encouraged to have lots of hubs and innovation centers, etc. But we don't encourage the same attitude and the same approach to scaling what we do. And indeed, we've come to the stage where the perfect, i.e. having the, the, the fanciest bit of, of, of technology, the most amazing corporate structure, is really becoming the enemy of the good. And the good for us must be to have as many people brought to the table as possible. And that's where impact lies. Impact lies on making available those amazing innovations, but they have to be scaled. So colleagues, I wanted to, to take a pause there and ask um, some, of, some of the other members of the panel to jump in. But I'd like to close by saying, we need to scale, we need to leverage, and we need to ensure our states are structured as and behave as social enterprises if we're to tackle the enormous problems we have across our communities. Thanks a lot. So who's going to take up the flag? Um, Luciana? Please, and, and just say a little word about, about your background, et cetera, okay. Luciana. Uh, Koja, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation. I am Italian. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I, after a long life in private, found the um, sort of impact fund, and so we finance social enterprise in Italy and some other investment in Europe. We have, from my experience, it related to Italy and Europe. We have, however, a company that uh, is financing microfinance in uh, South. Southeast Asia. So I have some experience because I visited India mainly to, to understand a little bit about the framework of social enterprises in the developing countries that obviously is substantially different than, than in Europe. Our experience of in Europe, more than in other places uh, of, of, of the world, this state is a, in a certain way a social enterprise. In Europe, more or less 25% of the GDP is created by the state through social services, uh, education, um, any other, any other uh, uh, healthcare system. So basically, this state is the major provider of social services to the city. Uh, probably this part, in, in this way, we, uh, the, the, the percentage is much higher, surely, than the United States, but obviously more than many developing countries. However, even in Europe, the state is in trouble to be an entrepreneur, is in trouble to be not bureaucratic, to innovate the services, because it's a system, it's a global system where any innovation is very difficult to be uh, offered and uh, uh, also this this innovation needs to make some mistakes and typically cities does not accept the state uh, takes this type of risk to, to make mistakes. So recently, recently means in the last 20-25 years in Europe, Italy is a good example from this point of view, the state started to outsource part of the service for various reasons to be more efficient, more effective, less bureaucratic, but also to give uh, some money, to pay services that could innovate uh, or bring new system to uh, deliver this type of service. So uh, some social enterprise are in a sort of uh, R&D of the social services in Italy, for example, because they are tackling some social needs in a different way, using uh, the, the, the money of the state. 
So this is, is not an easy experience because allocation of money is not always easy from this point of view because typically the state, they try to allocate money through bid. And in the bid, there is the issue of the price, quality, difficult to measure. But in certain cases, uh, the state were, was able to give, to, to finance uh, social enterprise that were able, are able to deliver some social services in a better way. That means uh, more effective, uh, uh, sometimes um, saving money. So from this point of view, I do not think that the state can be as itself an entrepreneur. The way to, to promote entrepreneurship is to finance private entrepreneurship strictly controlled by the state, because obviously the state being the major financer have to control the outcome of this type of innovation. So this is my, in my this is the experience that I want to bring to the table. I understand that in the developing countries, the, the, the state are less rich or more poor because of even our balance sheet now in Europe, we have a lot of debt. So we were in a certain way rich. We are still rich because we spend debt, not because we spend uh, the tax money. But I think that one way is not only to attract the money of the state, but also money of donors. We need to, to, to I, my suggestion, if I can bring one suggestion, is to match between state public money and donors' money to finance innovation. And not only uh, the extreme need, there are situations where you have to, to face uh, the, the need of the moment. But on, on investment in the long term, we need, any country need to find new solution to, to the problems, more effective, uh, more efficient, uh, that we need more money, not for saving money, but using better the same quantity of money. So this is, uh, for example, many of our companies are working in this way, trying to create joint venture with the state, uh, proposing new way to tackle the, 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 the social need that every day we have in our countries. So I hope that this experience can be uh, it can be helpful, uh, at least in thinking and uh, bringing some experience. Thank you. Luciano, thanks a lot. And I'm, I'm challenged by your suggestion that the state can't be entrepreneurial um, and that should be outsourced. And it's certainly a matter we, we, we would need to, to take up in a broader discussion. And I think certainly the idea of the state financing innovation is, is certainly not, um, it, it's a good one. And, it, it doesn't happen as much in the global south as say in the, in the north where most of the iPhones we use are financed by USDA, um, um, the US Army um, in, in investments, etc. But I'd, I'd like to turn now to Doreen. Doreen, you, 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 you spend a lot of time in a part of the world and in a country which is seen to a large extent as having done a lot of social entrepreneurial um, in, implement a lot of social entrepreneurial approaches in its development track. Talk to us about the notion of, this, of the state as a social enterprise. Great, Kojo, and, uh, and a big welcome to everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be part of this conversation. So just, to, just a little background before I, I jump into that. Um, so I am Doreen Shanaz. I'm based out of Singapore. I'm a Bangladeshi American, moved here from New York um, 16 years ago. And um, it's very interesting because when I was in New York, I actually had uh, uh, a substantial size social enterprise, which was a global marketplace, online marketplace for um, handmade goods, which I grew and sold to uh, National Geographic. Now, interestingly, I think one of the big takeaways for me when I was running that was how difficult it was uh, to be a social entrepreneur and raise capital, especially as a woman and a woman of color. And that's sort of what propelled me when I moved to Singapore to really pursue that in the sense, how do we actually bring in women who represent half of the global population um, effectively into the equation? So that really has been sort of the, you know, my pursuit. And the result of that was creation of IX 11 years ago, actually uh, in Bellagio, Italy, when the impact investing term was coined. Um, I was part of the, the group which kind of worked at this. 
And what's very interesting is if you look at it, um, the social entrepreneurship, the movement really got accelerated when the whole notion of impact investing came into the scene. So it's, it's very interesting, Gold, you're absolutely right. It has been around for many, many years. I mean, of course, Jed has written, um, you know, volumes about it, but it really was that when impact investing came into space, people started sitting up and saying, hey, you know what? Um, perhaps it's not just about uh, nonprofits and um, the civil society, but you do need to have the private sector, public sector, and civil society coming together. And that's where you know, very effectively impact investing comes in because you do have a notion of financial return. Um, it's very interesting to sort of run a company like IAX, which has been sort of a pioneer in this space and then had to create the entire infrastructure um, around this over the last 11 years, because we not only saw that we had to work with enterprises, um, which again, there are hundreds of thousands of such enterprises you know, in Asia, um, and we work across 46 countries. But what was very interesting to see is how little the government was actually doing. So going to your question of government being a social enterprise, um, perhaps they need to start thinking like that. But um, so far in the last over a decade that we have been working, at least in Asia and Pacific, it has been very, very slow. So I always say the work that we have done, it's in spite of the government. Um, and I think we have been very effective in being able to bring in um, the private sector into the equation, where again, in Asia, the private sector is very, very conservative. So one of the things I think to keep in mind, um, I would say again, whether it's state is uh, an entrepreneur or not, I think the biggest question is the fact that if we are going to actually move the needle, then we cannot exclude women uh, from the financial markets. And women are excluded and even more so now with pan the pandemic and COVID, and there's deeply rooted sort of injustices um, and literally women have no voice or value in the system. So I think it is, it is interesting. I think if you are actually trying to solve social issue and if you don't have women as a part of the solution, um, then it is very difficult. We will be having the same conversations years from now. Um, now, it's what's very, very interesting, I think for us, what we have done because we have focused on this issue of bringing women as a part of the equation, um, we have been able to bring that into every sense of financial system and financial growth. So it's really looking at women uh, and across their journey, not as just say microfinance borrowers, but really growing that into almost a dairy business and growing that into coming into a financial market. So really working with women along the journey to make sure they are part of the financial system. Um, so that they can actually contribute and be able to bring in that, um, you know, $28 trillion that we're losing every year in the global economy because they're not a part of it. Um, so just one last thing, which is in terms of from IX, what we're doing. So we have been able to create the world's first social stock exchange. We actually created that uh, for the Mauritian government in partnership with them in Mauritius. Um, we actually created the, the first gender lens impact assessment methodology um, through IRIS, uh, working in GIN. And, and also we run the world's largest crowdfunding platform for impact investing, which has unlocked over $200 million over the last decade. And I think what I'm really, really proud of is the fact that we created the world's first gender lens debt security, which is listed on a stock exchange, uh, the Women's Livelihood Fund. And only when we can get all the governments to actually embrace these initiatives and really have the notion of uh, social equality and social justice, I think then we'll know that they're actually acting like entrepreneurs and really thinking of all their citizens and thinking of scale that brings in the 99%. Doreen, thanks a lot. And I'm, and I'm very, I'm very pleased that you mentioned the, 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 the opportunity to use female inclusion and women's inclusion as a way of creating leverage and creating scale, because in a sense, it's the easiest and, and the most accessible form of scaling that we could have globally. And your work, certainly in terms of creating the first um, social impact exchange fund in, in, in Mauritius is something that certainly needs to be needs to be to be replicated. And, and I think in terms of the, the issue of scaling and making the, the state act entrepreneurially, 
what's more entrepreneurial than setting up a social stock exchange? Um, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I think those are some of the things that we must think about as, as we move forward to, to have more impact. I'm very glad <clears throat> um, to, to introduce our, 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 next, um, our next speaker um, who's just joined us. Um, Tuna is, a, is, is, a, is an amazing social entrepreneur based in Namibia and, and doing very innovative, very innovative, um, very innovative things and, and also has a perspective which I think in many respects may be slightly more uh, closer to the ground and, and, and closer to where we need to be getting to and, and the problems to be solved. Tuna, welcome. Um, we, we're glad you were able to join us and um, please speak to us. Yeah. Uh, tell Thank us a little you. bit about yourself first. Okay. Um, well, my name is Tuna Willem. I was born and bred in Namibia and uh, of late, since leaving my corporate job, um, I have started a company called Innovate. Uh, the initial idea was that we would look at crafting social and economic coalitions. In, in principle, the idea is perfect, but I think on the ground, the web is thin and far and wide and there's strings and dotted lines. And one of the, the, the biggest challenges was to scope and it still remains to scope out the landscape. I think it's to be able to also define who is really doing what effectively in terms of their set out mandates within the space of you know, development and development related issues. And I think in a small country like Namibia and a newly independent country um, compared to other African countries, we still have a very long way to go to create synergies uh, between development efforts in, in the political sector, development efforts in the public sector, private sector, across the board. And I think you know, when I was listening to what Doreen was saying, uh, in terms of you know the funds that they're raising, the social stock exchanges, etc., those are things that we concepts that we just aspire to. We, you know, you want to use the, the colloquial term, you drool over it, because you can see that it's a reality. But the the structural and the, and the systemic challenges that we have in getting there are very very real. So you know, the role of entities like Innovate as a social enterprise is to really try and number one, besides just looking at you know, commercializing or you know, creating value from the social challenges we have, is to actually build and develop the market. And that's where we're really finding where our work is. And I think that you know, in closing, the smartest way for us to do it is not just on our own, but to build partnerships with technical and financial partners, specifically technical, because they know how the game is played. They know what needs to be done. So that's where we are. And those are the challenges and the opportunities and the spaces we have found ourselves in. But it's, it's a good game. Gina, thanks a lot. And as ever, succinct and, and to the point and on the ground trying to make, make, make things happen. Um, the, the last speaker, and we, we generally save the, the, the best for last, is, is obviously Jed. Um, Jed needs no SOCAP introduction, but um, for the uh, uninitiated, I'm sure he'll share a few words about his background. But Jed, can you pull some of this together, um, particularly from the sort of philosophical perspective? How do we, and should we even be thinking of the state as a social enterprise? So first off, thanks very much for your kind words. And obviously I'm uh, really pleased to be in this conversation uh, with so many folks who have really done such great work uh, in the space for all of our benefit. Um, I, I would align myself with everybody's comments. I, I feel like in some ways uh, where you stand depends on where you sit. And we each have uh, come into this practice uh, from different histories and perspectives. We're operating in different country and cultural contexts. Uh, we have different resources um, that we can uh, bring to our work. And all of that uh, kind of shades our perspective with regard to how we view the role of the state relative to social enterprise development and the possibility of the state to, to be supportive or not. Um, and so in my case, I uh, became, my, my first part of my career was spent on the ground in youth and community development. And I became very frustrated with the role of the state as a funder. And uh, I said at the, um, in retrospect that, that money in the public sector moves on the basis of politics, perception and persuasion and not performance. And uh, it was part of that conclusion that kind of drove me out of the traditional kind of nonprofit and philanthropic space towards something else. And 
I ended up um, landing in a position to be founding director of Red F and working with a portfolio of social enterprises in the Bay Area in San Francisco and spent 11 years uh, exploring a whole host of strategies around how do you support and invest in those enterprises to help them uh, achieve different levels of scale. I think when we talk about scale, it's important to recognize that there are some things that scale for breadth and some things that scale for depth. And uh, we, we need to recognize that it's not a uh, one shoe fits all kind of answer. And I think broadly speaking, uh, the answer to this question of the state as social enterprise really depends on the country context and the history. Uh, in, in the US, uh, I, I'll just speak from kind of, you know, that perspective, although I think we all kind of like uh, have our, our angles on this. But from the US perspective, um, I remember having a conversation with a, the head of a, a major international foundation based in the United States. And I said, we were interested in entrepreneurial approaches to addressing homelessness, and that we were looking at wanting to start businesses as a driver uh, for impact and providing transitional employment. And the response of this gentleman was to say, if there's one thing we know about nonprofits uh, is that they cannot run business enterprises. So if you have new money, you should put it into job training and placement programs. Don't do anything around business startups. And of course, uh, on the one hand, I'm hearing that. And on the other hand, in our community, uh, we were seeing uh, 20, 30, 40 entrepreneurs who, because they couldn't get their people employed by for-profits or into job training programs, were starting business ventures. They were starting landscaping, uh, screen printing, a host of different things. And so, uh, and at that time in the States, there was no broad support for that type of work, either in the public or the philanthropic space. And so in contrast, I know my colleagues in the UK, it was a whole different conversation where the home office sponsored policy and funding to really support uh, enterprises, uh, community interest corporations, and a host of other types of things. So let me just kind of stop there. I think that uh, what all of us have expressed is truth uh, with a small t relative to this question. If you put it all together, you get truth with a big t, which is uh, I think we all have parts of what is ultimately the answer we seek. Uh, Kojo, back to you. Jed, thanks a lot. And, and it's, it's very typical of Jed to bring, to, to herd the, the, the cats together. So Jed, thank you. You know, uh, but Jed, let me pick up on the point, uh, the point you make about, you know, people in the NGOs and, 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 and social space not being able to run businesses. I'm not necessarily sure I, I, I buy into that. And increasingly we find the, the, the you know, Doreen would certainly push back against that as, as would Tuna and, and people like myself. But I think as, as Luciano said right from the start, how do we mobilize these resources? How do we bring them to bear in a way which, which themselves can create leverage? And even though the, the state may not in of itself be entrepreneurial, it can create a social entrepreneurial environment. It can create a policy framework which allows, which allows social entrepreneurs to thrive. And, I, and, and, I, and, and one way is the way, for example, someone like Doreen is doing with, with, with IIX and creating social stock exchanges you know, in, in Mauritius, and hopefully we'll, we'll do some of it in, in mainland Africa going forward because those are the sorts of entities which we need to support the tuners of the world to do what they do well. But let me just uh, quickly clarify. I I'm not saying I affiliate myself with that perspective. I'm saying that my work for a decade was in, in a sense the antithesis, uh, proving that that individual was wrong with that statement. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that the, the role of the state, as you say, is to create that enabling environment, that, that supportive place of policy, potentially funding, uh, and if nothing else, removing barriers to our being more entrepreneurial. And I guess uh, Tuna or Doreen, I'd be curious about your perspective around, um, do you see the state as enabling or uh, blocking progress in this area? Um, I think, uh, Jed, it's very interesting. So we do see, just as you said, it's different behavior in different countries. So I think, um, you know, for us, um, one of the things that we are very focused on um, 
is now obviously we have a $150 million women's livelihood bond series. So we are now bringing out the third one in the market. And uh, this is a bond that pulls together enterprises um, from various countries. And actually some of them are nonprofits, you know, in that, in that pool. And we structure um, this very innovative structure. We put it out in the market um, for the investors to buy. So the interesting thing is, um, you know, there are certain countries that's very easy to do that. Um, so for example, Cambodia. Uh, we have a number of entities from Cambodia. The government is um, actually quite helpful in the sense that um, we don't have a foreign exchange issue. Uh, the Cambodian um, the economy is pegged to dollar. Um, the similarly say in Indonesia now, the government is now waking up to the fact that they do need private sector investments to come in and they need to support innovative structures like this. So they are making the regulations you know, much more um, workable. Now, one of the things that I think someone mentioned um, about the donor countries, I do think when we're talking about the governments, it's just not the countries where the enterprises are located, but also the donor countries who do need to now start acting more entrepreneurially and more, being more innovative. So we do see some of that, um, you know, with the arms of USAID, you know, with arms of uh, DFAT, mm -hmm. the Australian government, um, you know, with Global Affairs Canada, where we are seeing that, you know, groups, um, teams who are actually now looking beyond their usual uh, jurisdiction of, you know, just thinking about development the way it is, because they can actually play a very effective role in leveraging, um, you know, basically innovative financial instrument, which will create scale, um, you know, which we are doing. We're Absolutely. Seeing. Absolutely. And, and Doreen, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I have to, to, to cut you off. In, in, no, in, of course, in, of course. No, absolutely. And everyone has to talk. Yeah. Yeah. But, but th this is fascinating. And, and we have the opportunity to continue this discussion tomorrow in the, in the plenary session. And, and, and I'm really looking forward to teasing out some of these ideas which have been developed. So thanks a lot, panel. And we reconvene tomorrow. Good. Thanks, everyone.